you. Do you know how Tony Chester has grown learning and fun together by using the word? Today's talk is entitled Bringing Learning and Fun Together. Today's third Tony Chester will talk about this title and you can know how a business that produces and visual games is truly growing within the Ottawa province. For this guys talk, if you have any questions, please write them on the small sheet of paper you were given when you first arrived. One of our volunteers will collect it from you later during this jazz talk. <coughs> Tony Cheston will have the chance to answer your question during the QA version, which is led by one of our English speaking volunteers. Now, without any further hesitation, please welcome Tony Cheston with a big round of applause. Okay, good afternoon, thank you. Um, the talk today is about bringing learning and fun together. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? okay. I mean, the front seats, they're not more expensive. <laughs> come to the front. In the theatre, you pay more to come to the front. <laughs> Allow me by telling you a little bit about myself. I don't know if you noticed from my accent. I am actually British. Oh, why so many holes? <laughs> okay. Um, a few times when I've been back home, people have asked me, where are you from? South Africa? Germany? So I guess, over time, I've lost my accent. This is probably due to the fact that my father was a British soldier. So we were stationed in many countries in the world. I hardly ever lived in England. In fact, my very first connection with South Korea was when I was three months old. My father was sent to fight in the Korean War. Strangely enough, I didn't know anything about that until 2007, after my father died, and I inherited his war medals. My parents never ever talked about that. When I was three, we moved to Singapore. And then from 1963 until 1966, we lived in Libya. In the 70s, after college, I tried to hitch back, hitchhike back to Libya with only 20 pounds in my pocket. I had to pay 15 pounds to cross the North Sea. So of course I didn't get very far. I ended up getting stuck in Germany. That's where I lived for 27 years. While I was in Germany, I met a Korean nurse. And we married. And we came to Korea for our honeymoon. Oh, sorry, what's happened here? Um, we came to Korea for our honeymoon. That was back in 1977. We visited regularly since then, until we separated and I came to live in Korea. I had a job working at a private academy for four years as a teacher. In 2009, I moved to Thailand. And I toured most of Southeast Asia. But somehow I missed Korea and I came back. I started a business in 2011. So that was my introduction. Now I'd like to know a little bit about you. We'll start with the gentleman at the front here. What's your name and where are you from? No, no, I'm only kidding. We can't do that. But I am curious about you. So, would you please raise your hand if you're a British English speaker? That means you use the words boot and bonnet of a car, sweets and biscuits. Oh, I'm not alone here, thank you. <laughs> what about American English speakers? If you say the trunk and the hood of a car, or you say candy and cookies, would you please raise your hand? 
Mm, majority. I thought so. Okay. Um, if you're an English teacher here in Korea, would you please stand up? Okay, two of you. Uh, if you've been here, please stay standing. <laughs> yeah. I think you're Korean, no? Yeah, I'm Korean. So if you've been here longer than a year, please sit down. Oh, nobody's left standing. Okay, fine. Anyway, now I know a little bit about who I'm talking to. Thank you very much. I'd like to take a step back in time. <coughs> Let me tell you about my earlier experiences here in Korea. Before I start, I would just like to make it clear I have no intentions of insulting anyone with my remarks. My wife was very sensitive about any what she thought were negative remarks, I would say, about Korea. I have great respect for how Korea has gone from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the most advanced in such a short space of time. All the remarks I make are based on my personal experiences and they're being told to help you understand how quickly things have changed here. There you see a picture of Seoul. Does anybody have any idea when that was taken? Okay, it was actually 40 years ago. That's what Seoul looked like when I first arrived. Very, very different to today's Seoul. What about this picture of Gwangju? That's a little bit more modern. That's 30 years ago. I don't know if you noticed, but it was very easy to find a parking spot. <laughs> when I first visited Korea, it was like stepping into a time machine. Life was very difficult, but everybody seemed to be happy, and I saw many more smiling faces than I do today. Everyone seemed to be in a hurry, but everyone was so closely knit. It was very difficult for me to know who were my in-laws, who were neighbors, who were friends. People just walked into the house and helped with cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry. Everybody shared what they had, including money. People out of the neighborhood that heard we were on our honeymoon brought gifts of food and gave us money and told us to travel around Korea. You must visit Seoul, Gyeongju, Jeju. These were the places that people wanted me to see. We had regular power cuts. Very often we would have to sit by candlelight. Cooking was done on charcoal bricks. <laughs> there was no constant running water. We had a bathroom. There was a huge tile bath with a tap or a faucet for the American speakers that was always open. But water only ran for a few hours and then through the night time. So we were usually woken in the middle of the night by the scream of air being pushed through the water pipes and then the trickle of water splashing into the tub. Hardly anyone had a car. The roads were very quiet. I don't know if you noticed here, but that is Seoul Station, here in front of City Hall. There were a few taxis, buses, bicycles, black chauffeur-driven cars, along with a few trucks and some strange three-wheeled vehicles. There were no tractors or machines for planting, cutting or threshing rice. Everything was done by hand. Oxen with carts were a regular sight, even in the towns. A curfew was still in place from 12 o'clock until 4 a.m. 
That was introduced after the Korean War and wasn't lifted until 1982. Policemen and soldiers used to carry rulers. They would regularly, regularly measure ladies' skirts or men's hair. If a man's hair was too long, a chunk would be cut out. There were often drills with air sirens. These still take place today. But in those days, everybody had to vanish. People had to hide. And if you were on a bus, you had to crouch under the window. Military chiefs would go through the town. And aircraft flew over the town very, very low. It was a very, very scary experience. On nearly every journey we did, we were stopped at military checkpoints. I remember my binoculars were confiscated. They were classed as a weapon. And my Super 8 Cine camera was looked at very, very strangely. I couldn't even buy the films I needed for it here. Also, I don't remember seeing any building higher than six floors. The first high-rise high buildings started in Seoul at the end of the 70s. The tallest building I remember, I think was six floors in Busan. It was a department store. I think it was Lotte. This was the place that most people wanted to take me. Koreans were very proud of their department store. It's very hard to believe that this is the same country. Such dramatic changes have taken place in just over 40 years. I remember my eight-year-old niece coming home from school about 11 p.m. and then having to do homework. She'd always left for school well before I woke up, and I'm an early bird. I hardly ever saw her. That hasn't changed much. Today, students work hard and long, going from school to hack ones, and then to libraries to do homework. Some students study up to 16 hours a day. I believe it's because of this hard work and this close-knit society that Korea has developed so quickly. However, it has its drawbacks. Students often come home physically and mentally exhausted. Korea has a very high rate of suicides among students. Please keep that in the back of your minds and try to understand the pressure and the frustration that students are put through due to the society. When I was a teacher, I taught all age groups from kindergarten through to adult classes. The youngest students were always full of energy. They were inquisitive and eager to learn. It was always a joy to come to school and teach them. But the older the students got, the more I could see that they were burnt out. It was difficult to motivate them. And many would just sit and listen to the lessons without participating. Sometimes I thought I had a bunch of zombies. <laughs> I used to get angry with students who would put their heads on the desk while I was teaching. Or students who would come late and not give an explanation, thinking they'd been playing around or messing with their friends, because that's what I used to do. But in reality, it was their inability to tell me that they had to stay at school longer, they had to do extra work, or they had to take care of their siblings. Often they had a very plausible excuse. They just didn't know how to tell me. We need to take a look at the Korean education system and try and understand why this is happening. I think the biggest problem in Korea is that studying seems to be more important than actual learning. 
In my early te teaching years here, I had often conflicts with my academy director and parents because I didn't understand the culture or the system. I had parents complaining that I was teaching too slow. I remember one mother telling me, at the other academy, my son finished three books a month. My son was a good student. He could memorize well. But he couldn't hold a conversation in English. He was like a robot, programmed to repeat what he was told. He was great at answering multiple choice questions. But he couldn't write a complete sentence in English. He knew all the grammar rules better than I did. I often had to admit my ignorance as to not knowing why we say something the way we do. We didn't learn the complex in and out of complex grammar, sorry. We didn't learn the ins and outs of complex grammar exceptions. The primary focus in Korea is to learn grammar and rules through chance and such like. Conversational skills are given the lowest priority. But concentrating on grammatical structure is not an effective way to teach or to learn English. It becomes difficult for students to think outside the box and they lack the thinking skills needed to take part in meaningful debates. Many Koreans often struggle to communicate in English, even though they've studied English for many years. They just haven't had the practice and don't have the confidence needed. Koreans study to get high test scores so as to get into schools with good reputations, not necessarily schools that are best for their needs. Another problem in Korea is this age thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first question you usually get asked in Korea is, how old are you? Although that's considered pretty rude, Western world. In Korea it is very important because of this hierarchy system. It's not possible to have a friend outside your age group in Korea. Ten years ago when I first came here, my Korean friend, he was considerably younger than I, used to introduce me to people as being his father. This used to embarrass me. It even made me angry. You know, here everyone is Chang, Nuna, Imo, Samchan, brother, sister, aunt, uncle. Koreans have so many brothers and sisters. <laughs> Koreans even share their wives. They say our wife and not my wife, like we do. <laughs> and this also has its problem in private academies. The object of a language school is to teach a language. But the students are kept in their age groups and not according to their ability. I spent many hours trying to persuade my director to change this, but to no avail. So I gave up trying to single-handedly change the system and had to change my way of thinking. One or two generations ago, the age of industrialization, Test scores were important, and unfortunately, Korea hasn't gotten around to getting out of this way of thinking yet, but I have noticed some changes. Too many hagwans are business-based, meaning that many directors are more interested in earning money and not on the purpose of their institute. But this isn't necessarily their fault. Too many parents are stuck in their old-fashioned way of thinking. The what was good for us will work for our children. They don't take into account forces have on directors to appease to their wants and demands. 
In January this year, the Korean Times revealed that a survey showed that 70 percent, 7 0, 70 percent of middle and high class students were dissatisfied with their English lessons. If you ask a student who wants to learn English why they want to learn English, you inevitably get the answer to travel, to get a better job, to talk to foreigners. Yes, to talk. There is a serious mismatch between what students want to learn and what is taught. They know their lessons are too grammar-focused and test-oriented. We shouldn't ignore the fact that grammatical ability is a key component to the co college entrance exam. But English must become more practical, focusing more on speaking and writing. So don't you agree, those of you who are teachers, that you should make your teaching more fun? So what can we do to help our students? You need to understand the complex education culture you're teaching in, and recognize that you as teachers can help your students with the methods you choose to teach by. Move away from these rigid multiple choice fill in the blank assignments. Leave that to your Korean co-teacher. Get your students to analyze content that they're interested in. Ask your students questions. The choice of game helps a child's mental, physical, emotional, and social development. They are indispensable in making, the children, in making children become mature and confident adults. If your goal is to help students learn English, get them speaking it. I know, the problem is so many Korean children are shy or too embarrassed to speak. So, create a classroom environment of inclusiveness and make it fun. Give them assignments that will allow them to rediscover their creative side. I used to get my students to do most of the work. I always started my lesson with a role call. I know some people think that's too military style, but I disagree. I think it's a good way to let your students know that the lesson has now started. Nobody was allowed to talk except for the persons whose name I would call out. After a while, I would let the students do the role call for me. You'd be surprised what strange habits you have that you didn't know about. Students can imitate you very, very well. <laughs> the lesson usually started off with a good laugh. Try to think as a child and not as a teacher. When I first started teaching here, I used to tell students to prepare for tests. I would say, okay guys, on Thursday we'll do a spelling test. This is how most of them looked. And what happened? On Thursday, only 50% of the students came. <laughs> so I changed the word to quiz. Of course, only for the students, not for the director or for the parents. When I said on Thursday we'll do a quiz, I usually have 100% attendance. And often if I asked, what should we do today? I was deafened by the cry of, quiz, quiz, game, game. I spent hours making games. Remember that was 10 years ago. These days, there are so many resources on the internet that you don't need to invest so much time on preparation. <coughs> Just Google ESL games. More than 20 million hits. Important is, however, your choice and how to use these games. They must be used in an effective way. Otherwise, you'll have parents wanting to kill you. <laughs> but why games? <coughs> Well, let's be honest, children love to play games. I still do. They love to be in groups. 
and they love to be competitive. They become excited and they forget about their shyness. They open up and through playing games they learn communication. They learn to focus their attention and they learn they cannot always win. Also, it's a great way for the teacher to relax and reduce stress. So what games are good and what should you be careful of? I'm sure you all have your favorites and many good ideas. Allow me to tell you some of them I used to play and have. The great time killer at the end of the lesson is handle. It can be used for recently learned vocabulary or for revision. It can be used for complete sentences or grammar. But once the students know how to play, let them be quiz master. Be lazy. Just sit back. Let them enjoy themselves. If I was the game master, then I would sometimes jumble the letters or jumble the words if it was a sentence. The only hint they got was how many of them there were. It made them think harder. I used to play this for the last five minutes of nearly every lesson. And I see some of you still trying to oh, sorry. I see some of you still trying to work out what that is. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any idea? Yeah. Oh come I, on! I love my teacher. I love my teacher, yes. Okay. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo is a great game. Not only for old age pensioners. <laughs> there are many free bingo card creators online, and it only takes a few minutes to design your cards. They can be designed to teach almost anything, and all grades. This is one of the games that I used to help the weaker students catch up with the other students. I would say, okay guys, today I've got a headache or I'm not feeling too well. I need a teacher. By the way, that's a good way to get a free neck and shoulder massage. <laughs> <laughs> there was never a shortage of volunteers. <clears throat> I tried to choose the weaker students, those who were scared or those who were shy, and get them to sit a distance away from the players. They had to shout out the words. I made them repeat the words three times, and that way I could control their pronunciation and the words that they were having difficulty with. Another good game is memory. Just look at those smiling faces, how excited they are. <laughs> memory is also a great card game for learning new vocabulary. It can be used not only for object recognition, but also for spelling. If a student finds a pair, get them to spell the word correctly. Depending on your class size, the ideal number of players is around eight. If you have too many students, make pairs or small groups and let them communicate. Again, mixing the weaker students with the stronger ones. This game always brought excitement into the lesson. One of my students' favorite games was Scrabble. Fortunately, most of my class sizes were around eight, so it was easy to play with four teams of two students. I guess 12 would be okay too, but any class size larger could be a problem, unless of course you have more than one struggle game. I used to help students who were stuck by giving hints such as, think of an animal, I can see something to eat. Sometimes it was easier not to use the ball. I'd split the students into four groups, give each group 25 tiles, and they had to use as many tiles as possible making connected words the same way as in a Scrabble book, vertical and horizontal, and score a point for each letter used. If they managed to use all the tiles, they'd get 10 points bonus. This was a time control game, so each game lasted three minutes, then the tiles would be exchanged to the next group, and so on, so that each group had a go with each set of tiles, just to make it fair. After returning from Thailand, I decided I wanted to concentrate more on this side of teaching. But often I could never find the right games. 
I studied the business making gains for education. We're still in our early stages. Being in a foreign country, there have been many hurdles to overcome. But we still have a few more to conquer. Our logo is Happy Students Learn Better. We've developed a few games and have many more in production. Our first games will be on sale this year in the shops. We looked at the problems that can occur and tried our best to eradicate these. Most games that we used were short-lived. Paper cards would get torn, creased, bent, or too dirty to be used for their purpose. Our cards are made of PVC, so they don't crease or fray at the edges. And they're washable, should the child have sticky fingers. I don't mean stick them in a washing machine, but I mean use them with a wet bathroom cleaner. Games often become useless because a piece goes missing or gets damaged. We offer a one-year replacement for any card that is damaged or lost. And we try to make our games adjustable to your needs. Usually each game is actually three games. One for teaching vocabulary, one for reading, and one for spelling. If there's a difference between American English and British English, like at the beginning of the presentation, we teach both words. Let me introduce very quickly to you three of my games. Alphabet and E. It's for the very young learners. It's a card game to teach the alphabet. It consists of two sets of alphabet letters, small and capitals, lowercase and uppercase for American speakers. The letters are printed on the same markings as an English exercise book. This is so the students learn the dimensions and also avoids any confusion between the letters B and Q or D and P. We include three rules for three games. There you see the kids playing alphabet memory where they have to match the small letter to the big letter. Numerotony. Numerotony is a card game that teaches colors numbers from 1 to 10. It has four sets of cards. Two times the digits 1 to 10, one set of word cards for the numbers 1 to 10. 10 basic colors, two sets of, and one set of word cards for those colors. And each color also represents a different number. Through different combinations of these sets you can teach Number or color recognition. Word recognition, reading, spelling. Using the color picture cards, you're enabled to alternate your questions, such as how many or what color, just to enhance listening. Again, there are three different games in this set. We also have a great time filler. What's Italy? This game can be five minutes or 40 minutes long. It consists of two sets of cards. One is definitions and one is letter cards. The two stacks are placed face down on the table. A definition card is turned over and then a letter card. And the player has to answer quickly. Depending on the ability of the students, I used to count down from five or three. And if not answered, it would automatically move on to the next player. Here students can use their imagination. For example, something in the sea, starting with T. Anybody, any idea? Okay. Some students, they're a bit slow, but they know a lot of adjectives, so they can use an adjective. T, tired. A tired fish. Okay. So, let me give you an example. Are you willing to play with me? Yes. yes, okay, I heard a yes. So, here we have the two decks of cards. I turn over the top card. Tell me something in Africa that begins with... Hmm. Okay, we'll start with the gentleman because I heard him shout yes. No, no, go turn around. Yes, I think you're from Australia, no? That's right. Don't make it too hard. <laughs> Because I think, I think you're pretty advanced. So I'm only going to give you three seconds. 
But my seconds are very fast. So. <laughs> and then we'll move, we'll move around. Okay? So, tell me something in Africa. Starting with the letter... Oh, B. Three. Oh, a bit. Two. <laughs> one. Oh, okay. Pass it. Okay, fine. Okay, we'll carry on with you. Okay, next one. Tell me something you cannot touch. Starting with the letter R. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Three. Three other letters doesn't show there. No, Did you say R? I said R. I'm sorry. R. What's wrong with Larry Wong? There we go. Uh, sorry, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, reality. two. Reality. Sorry? Real. 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 Okay, fine. Real. Real. So I think you get the idea. Okay, the two people who answered correctly, if you come to me at the end, I will give you a free game. <laughs> so we have a lot more information on our website including resources to help you make your lessons fun. There are explanatory videos, reviews from some of our customers, more ideas of what you can do with the cards, and also a word of form. We want to make our customers happy. And listen carefully to any criticism or suggestions. Let us help you make your students happy. I'd like to finish by emphasizing one more time, it has not been my intention to be little. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that I could give some of you some useful hints. And I'd also like to thank the GIC for giving me this opportunity. I wish all you teachers happy teaching. Thank you. Thank you.